Welcome to episode 50 of the Series About Security podcast for July 31st, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Princeton Wiley, and I'm joined this week by Mike Hillian, no Keith this week again, uh, and I think he'll be out next week, but after that, he, he should be back, hopefully. Um, and uh, Mike will start off this podcast. All right, thank you, Preston. Um, I want to talk about uh, data breaches at universities. Uh, there's been several within the past month or two. Uh, so I selected four. There might be more, but, but I came across four. And I'm going to kind of cover these one at a time, um, kind of in order of severity. So uh, the first one I'd like to discuss is uh, Stanford University. Uh, they announced recently that they have become a, a victim of a data breach. They, they didn't disclose a, a lot of details, and um, it was unclear exactly how significant of a breach it was, but they are encouraging um, all their SunNet uh, ID holders, uh, which is probably just the standard ID for, for the university, to go ahead and update their passwords. Um, it appears that this is probably the typical kind of a username password sort of breach. So um, they are they are dealing with that, and uh, it, it appears they responded uh, appropriately. They've got a message up on their site encouraging folks to change it. I think they also sent out emails uh, urging folks to change their password and encouraging uh, the use of strong passwords as well. Um, so that was one that came up recently. Um, the next one I'd like to discuss quickly here is the uh, University of Virginia. Um, this was not so much an electronic data breach as is more of a physical one. And we don't, I don't think we see too many of these anymore, but uh, uh, what happened for the University of Virginia is that they mailed out brochures on July 3rd, and they used, uh, according to, to their site, they used uh, some older, out-of-date program for uh, printing the brochures. And what was included on these brochures that went out to approximately 18,700 uh, University of Virginia students was uh, it had their social security numbers printed on the brochures. So clearly not a good thing. Um, um, their response was that they are updating their software, which is a good thing. Um, they, are, they are trying to mitigate any damage. And they have offered all the affected students a free year of access to a credit monitoring service. And they've also established a toll-free number that students and parents can call. So um, not, not a good data breach in this case, but the brochures were mailed to the students themselves. So assuming that they didn't fall into malicious hands, uh, the impact of this one may not be too bad. Um, but clearly not a good thing. Uh, it, it makes you wonder how, you know, in today's world, a program could be that out of date, how social security numbers could just be passed through um, like that. So Yeah, I consider this probably one of the most unacceptable and avoidable to have the probably of the data breaches that you're yeah. going to go over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fortunately it didn't disclose more details. But yeah, this seems like just a real oops. Uh, uh, somebody clearly, you know, was not paying close attention. For, for this to happen. I mean, you think about it, it's printed out, it's in their hands. Yeah, all you have to do is look at the output and say, hey, this isn't right. This isn't right. And obviously yeah. that one didn't happen. And, and social security numbers are pretty unique. You know, um, you, you, if you're paying close attention, you're not going to confuse it for a phone number or anything. It's a um, pretty unique pattern. So, um, but um, I think they're addressing it, um, you know, the, the best way they can at this point. It's unfortunate that it happened. And, um, you know, hopefully moving forward, they won't um, they won't make this mistake. I, I think what I was impressed by was the fact that they did offer the free credit monitoring and they set up telephone numbers, so they are willing to discuss it and and address it. Um, you know, and it, just on a, on a side note, you know, when I first started going to school almost 20 years ago, I remember at first they, they used to print your social security number over everything. You know, it's like your class ID, it's all my, I, you know, my student ID card. And even at that time, I thought, this is really bad. This is not how they should be handling social security numbers. So um, 
I don't know, I, I can see this kind of mistake happening, but I don't know why it wasn't like the student ID number. And I sure hope that the student ID number in their system is not the social security number for the student. <laughs> um, and there was nothing to indicate that that was the case, but let's hope that uh, they've uh, limited the damage that was done by this and that they won't have any of these issues going forward. I wouldn't be surprised if they switched over and their old program used the social security number and their new program had their student ID number or something like that. And that was the, that was the error. Yeah. I mean, a lot of universities have been switching. It seems like a long time ago, but they've been switching. Uh, from social security numbers to unique right. identification numbers specifically for the, uh, the school. Yeah, and, and you know, I think one of the challenges for a university is um, I don't know that they adapt to new technology as quickly as, as, or, as businesses do. They have a lot of legacy applications in some cases running, and that might have been, this might have been a throwback to one of those programs. like. You know, 90% of their stuff's running on the new infrastructure, but here's this, you know, this one unique feature, you know, these, these brochures still don't get printed out under this old program. And, uh, you know, there's like 5% of the IT staff even understand how that program works because it was written, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So, um, so yeah, it, this one I'm sure is a wake-up call for them, though, that it needs to be addressed and um, hopefully they, they contain this and it won't go any further. And thankfully, it didn't disclose any additional data. Um, Social Security number was bad enough, but uh, if it had given away more details, I think um, I think it could have been really bad, as we'll talk about later here. <laughs> um, uh, so, so the next one uh, I wanted to discuss was an attack uh, on, on the University of Delaware uh, that it affected the personal data for 72,000 staff members. Um, in this one, let's see what was disclosed. It says personal information. Okay, the, the data breach included names, addresses, uh, social security numbers, as well as those unique university ID numbers, <laughs> um, which correlates to a, a you know high risk of identity theft. Um, it sounds like this particular uh, breach was the result of, a, uh, or at least the theory is it was related to a, a flaw in the Struts2 software. It was, it was a Java-related hack. So again, here's a, here's a Java program that was that was vulnerable, and this information was was leaked. So. Um, this is, is not good, and I rank this higher than the previous one because one, there's a larger number of users affected here, 72,000, and also additional details were released. Um, not, not only was it social security numbers and names in this case, but you have addresses and um, the university ID numbers as well. So, um, you know, not, not good, not good for them. Um, and, you know, I, I find it interesting that so many universities are kind of, you know, just in these recent months are really disclosing these types of data breaches. I think there's clearly kind of a, a motivated attack going on here. I don't know if it's uh, folks are seeing universities as the low-hanging fruit or, um, you know, that that you know, if someone finally realizes universities have data that they can that they can utilize, but, you know, if you think about it, we haven't heard a lot about these things previously. We're always kind of talking about businesses uh, being attacked, but but now it seems like they figured out that there's a there's a real opportunity with, within these universities. Yeah, well, we can say, it seems like they focus on universities at rate so often, and you get these just long string. Of university hacks, it seems to it seems to happen once every couple of years. It seems like where you just have this. It's like somebody decides to hack a university and they succeed, and then it gets in the news, and then someone else is like, "Hey, I'll try that with this one," and then you know, and you get you get a bunch of them just happening yeah. over the course of a few months. 
Yeah, and, and it did not mention that uh, they're also a major research institution, um, and I'm sure that's sort of a, um, it, it did not mention that any research data was, was breached, but it seems like that would make them a higher target as well among universities. Uh, universities that do research have data that, that is valuable as well, um, which also makes it, I guess, more surprising as well because you think they would be trying to be more careful about protecting that. I don't know if it's a matter of just having the appropriate resources or if it's just, you know, you know, defend, you know, security is about layers of security, and, and in this case, you know, it'd be only as strong as your weakest link. So the job of fall, which was probably the third-party software they were running, is what got them in this case. Um, so yeah, um, but, but as, as, as bad as, as that is for, for the University of Delaware, I, I think the final data breach we'll discuss is, is by far the, the worst in, in nature. Um, and this, this actually uh, occurred in, in June. Uh, the University of Massachusetts uh, announced that they had a, uh, a breach of over 1,600 patient records. Uh, the information included in these records had the social security numbers, addresses, uh, patient names, dates of birth, health insurance company names, uh, insurance numbers, and the primary health care physician, and diagnoses, and procedure codes. Um, so clearly, um, some very, um, very personable, identifiable information was breached here, uh, a significant breach. Um, and the, the university says that it was, uh, that it was believed to be uh, the, the uh, act of uh, malware being downloaded onto one of their workstations. Um, their response, they said they are, um, they have in, they've now installed the automated software to detect, to detect malicious activity, and they've identified files and departmental computers containing personal information. Uh, they will also train current and new staff and security practices. Um, my response to that statement is, shouldn't you have already been doing that um, with this type of data? Um, this. It, it's surprising they said they'd installed automated software. It seems like they would have wanted to already have that in place, Con considering the, the type of data that they are holding on to. Well, um, I'm, I'm not full. I'm not an expert in HIPAA, but I'm sure this is some sort of HIPAA violation because maybe it was breached. But I know um, I've talked to a PCI compliance person. And they mentioned that a data point of sale system in a PCI system is not supposed to be used for anything other than point of sale stuff. It shouldn't be used for browsing the internet or any, anything like that. And it seems to me like when you're dealing with healthcare information, the same basic um, tenets probably should apply. If you're, if you, like, if you go to, if you're at a if you're dealing with healthcare information, you probably shouldn't be browsing the internet. Right. Malware is right. a bad click away. So um, I, I don't know if that's in the HIPAA stuff, but you know, uh, un unlike necessarily with your credit card information, with your healthcare information, there's a surprisingly no surprising number of people that actually have access to your your information, you have transcriptionists and things like that. I mean, this is people trying right. to get, move it from a more file-based system to a digital system, but you, you have all of the you know, nurses, doctors, you know, pharmacists and things like that to have access to this information. And so it's a, <coughs> it's unlike your credit card information, you swipe it at a point of sale system and it's off to the bank. Right. It's never stored on that system. Just, just kind of used as a temporary storage and then, and then it's gone. But it seems like this was a, this is another one of those that should have been prevented. And I'm guessing, as far as security practices, that's that's the security practice. Don't be don't be using this medical computer right. here to use to go to Facebook. Right. <laughs> well, and, and, so. and, and the thing is, um, 
you know, policy can help so much, but, you know, if it really is that you shouldn't be able to do those things on those computers, they should be locked down so you can't. Right. I mean, it should only run the software it needs to run, um, you know, if, if that, you know, if for some reason that computer, you should be able to go look up records and stuff. You need internet access, you know, it should be through like a proxy and only certain sites are allowed. You know, like medical sites that would be relevant, not Facebook and, and Twitter and stuff, um, because these are the you know these are the kinds of things that can happen. There should be some separation right. here. Um, and, but you're right. There's multiple paths for the data to become, you know, to be breached, and everyone in that line needs to understand their role. But I also think every piece of equipment used along that line should be locked down and protected. They, they should protect the users from themselves to a certain degree as well. Um, so that it becomes very difficult to to make something like this, to allow something like this to happen. I mean, um, I was kind of surprised it was malware when I read this. My first thought was somebody got a USB key dumped or they lost the laptop that contained all this personal right. information. I did not think it would actually um, come down to malware running. Um, again, don't, we don't know any additional details, but I hope that the computer, um, that the person logged in that computer wasn't running as an admin account when it, when it installed the malware. I know some malware does not need elevated privileges, but it seems like all those good security practices should be in place, especially on a medical computer. You know, right. um, it should have a heightened sense of security. It should be very difficult to do anything outside of the, the normal, um, you know, just running normal things on that system. Yeah, I don't know. And it's difficult, probably a, a, in a bit more difficult at a university, um, probably because you may be using, potentially using that data for research purposes as well. So yeah. you know, it's even, they're doing more exposure. Yeah. Uh, and like maybe a hospital, they use it internally for their hospital records. But in a university, there's kind of even more potential sharing of data and even more potential yeah. for this. And maybe it was on somebody's somebody's personal work. Yeah, I, 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 I do research on the on the data or something like that. Yeah, I, I should have mentioned that it's the Center for Language, Speech, and Hearing. That and even even then, it, it seems like if you're doing research on data, you don't need a person's social security number. Right. You don't need their address. And you, need, you don't need your name or date of birth. You can tie, right. you can tie that to an ID, and then if you, which would not be like a university, ID. right? I mean, research so, data should be anonymous. <coughs> so, so, yeah. I mean, it may have been people who signed up for a for a, a research study or something like that. For all, for all we know, yeah. So, oh, it's just patient records, but um, yeah, I don't, that's still medical information. Yeah, like I said, it's, it was the Center for Language, Speech, and Hearing, so I don't know, um, you know, it, it, you know, they, they may operate a little differently than like, you know, a, a hospital at the university as well, and maybe that's part of the problem is when you're dealing with this type of data, you need to treat it the same across all departments, right? You know, um, you need to treat it carefully. So yeah, to me, this was the one I found kind of the most, you know, like shocking. Like, oh, geez, this is, you know, really bad. Uh, not that the other ones are good necessarily, but you know, this is just clearly, if somebody came across this type of data, there's a lot of damage they can do. There's a lot of information that um, they discover related to the patient. Well, it seems like this is the one that's also probably most likely to result in some sort of fine from the from him. Uh, hit the violation as well. Um, yes. So this might have more, more more consequences to the university than just some reputation damage. There may actually be a monetary fine if they're found if they found or found in violation of some some regulation. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, I guess you know the the thing is uh, I think universities kind of need to be on guard. Um, and it, it is a difficult environment to secure, no doubt. Um, but uh, in, in the wake of recent breaches, you can kind of uh, assume that if you're in a university, there's probably some bad stuff already coming your way. Um, it seems like they're, they're on a kick right now where they're 
going through and seeing what they can get from, from each university they come across. Right. We, <laughs> we, we both work in the university environment, yes. and uh, we know, and I, I know and you know how, how it is. Um, it's, it seems like, I mean, unlike a corporate environment where it's pretty easy to lock down things, when you work for a research university, there's there's this there's this kind of spirit of openness, right? And wanting people to be able to do things and, and research things and, and kind of keep the door keep the doors open as much as you can to allow for that for that research. Where for for a corporate environment, it's typically close the doors as tight as you can and only let you know let things in as as you see, as you think, right. need to be done to do your business on a day-to-day -day basis. So, I mean, I, I don't know if that's some, if that needs to change or, or, or what. But yeah, I mean, how much can it change? But I mean, that's it's kind of the spirit of research, you know, and openness, and a lot letting letting the faculty at the university, you know, do their go do their thing without putting restrictions on them. Right, and that that's kind of the that's kind of the spirit nature of, of an educational environment. Really, is to is to keep the doors open and, and let let the faculty do do their thing. But you it, that's that creates exposure. Well, to things like that. It, it, it seems to me that social security numbers in universities should really really. Be locked down, right? Because and that, that, that I think is something that university have have been moving to yeah. is locking those down. Yeah. And as you can see, it's sometimes sometimes not kind of difficult. I guess, oh yeah, yes. I mean, the university needs social security numbers of right. students for you know for doing certain things like um like uh, financial aid yeah. and 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 things like that. So. It's 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 stuff you have to collect, but you have to keep secure. Yeah. So well, there should be just you know just a very small set of, of individuals can ever access that information, and it should be tracked kind of what they're doing with it as well. You know, and you know, um, I, I mean, I've seen this in other places when you don't need to disclose the entire social security number. You know, sometimes the last four digits is enough to do what you're accomplishing and then do that. You know, treat, you know, um, lock it down every way that you can and, and have software that's checking machines and, and servers for that type of information. Like I said, that's a pretty unique pattern uh, to it. And you can certainly flag things and say, this data looks suspicious on your machine and it needs to be, you need to clean it off, you know. Either remove it or confirm that it is not right is not confidential data. I guess companies need social security and social security numbers as well as far as employment rights right. go. But the with the university, this, you know, they still share this data. I mean, if you are a student, your social security number is shared because they need they need it for various purposes. So, and, and I believe the same is true if you're an employee. It's also, and you decide to become a student, I think they can just pull your information. And so, sharing and making things easy has its cost, and yeah. you know, there's no more exposure. So, yeah. Yeah, these, these are all pretty bad. These are all, I think that there's a lesson in all of them, all of these. I mean, the University of Virginia one, I think it's the one that. Was it just a brochure? But I think it was the most preventable. I do, I do as well. I mean, you, all you have to do is look. Oh, yeah, let's look. look. Let's yeah. look to see what we're printing out. Oh, yeah. look, there's social social security number there. Obviously, that wasn't done. So I think that was the most preventable one. And as you mentioned, the, the was it the University of Massachusetts. The, so the healthcare information that was probably the worst one. But seventy-two thousand staff. Uh, Staff right it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad as well from the University yeah. of Delaware, and uh, that sounds like a complete database dump. You know, to get that many. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like they just dumped the entire the entire database well, of, of 
names, addresses, social security numbers, and university IDs. Yeah, well, I totally agree about the University of Virginia, though, being the most preventable. I mean, they, they even, in their response, you know, they said, we immediately updated the computer program used to gather the student information to prevent any recurrence. Immediately updated it. So it was not as if it took them a great deal of time to fix the program. You know, right. it was just that somebody was not paying close enough attention. And it's unfortunate, you know, somebody had to be handling those brochures to, to mail them out and could have said, whoa, wait, what is that? Well, they sent them off to a third party to do the printing and the mailing. They didn't actually do that themselves, from, from my understanding. But still, they could have looked at the data. They could have looked, they could have looked at the output. They could have t look at it, looked at the sample output yeah. and said, is this what we want? And it's like, no, it's not. It has social security numbers on it. So yeah. we should redo that. But they didn't do that. They just sent the data off to the third party. The third party printed it out, and they probably just mailed them off. And that was that. Yeah. And then somebody probably got one and said, wait a second. There's That's my numbers number. on this. Yeah. And then made it made them aware of it. So in the in the uh, what the University of Delaware one was looks like it was a flaw in a, in a program related to possibly related to Java. Right. So uh, it doesn't it doesn't go in and say anything about if their Java was out of date, which is likely. Um, but. Yeah, and that's a tough one. That's a tough one because, as a university, or for that matter, as a business, you know, uh, some of the things we preach as security professionals is, you know, offload that responsibility. You know, if you don't have the expertise in house, let somebody write you a system and let them maintain a system for you that can protect this data. So, um, you know, that third party software, it, you know, in my mind, they may, you know, that's probably where the flaw was. Well, Struts 2 is a framework for application development within Java. Okay, so they were still running it. So I think they I think they they were still running it locally. I think they were still I think they were developing the software for doing it within that within that for that Struts two framework. Okay. So I I could blink in the article because I didn't know what it was. <laughs> oh this is <laughs> an elegant extensible framework for creating enterprise ready Java web applications. Yeah. yeah. So it's like I guess like cold fusion. Or something like that, as far as um, kind of a, a managed development environment or, or whatever. Yeah, it's so. just, it's hard to tell of Java, you know, because you really have to stay on top of it to keep it up to date. And even if it's up to date, who knows whether a, a zero day will come along and get you? You know what I mean? So, um, but they didn't really disclose any further. So. To me, it seems like they might have been out of date because they didn't go into further details and say, you know, the flaw that was exploited was in Java and had not been patched yet. Because um, that would have then gone back onto this kind of Java. So, um, again, it's, it's just a good reminder that we want to keep everything patched, everything running up to date, and uh, uh, really limit, you know, user access as well. Right. You know, um, and, and, it's, and I think it is more challenging in a, in a university environment because people have different roles, people tend to move around, you, you tend to have sort of jack of all trades in some areas, you know, you've got somebody that's doing maybe five different jobs and uh, in like a, a professional environment, they have checks and balances for that, but sometimes in a university, if you're, you know, you have folks that you don't have that checks and balances and, you know, they, they need this level of access for this one role, but their other role, they don't, and when they're crossing between the roles, these things can happen. You know, if they go in under the wrong ID, you know, they're, they're doing one job, they're doing it under another ID that has more privileges. Mm -hmm. You know, they can pull data that they typically would not be able to do. And I think you find more of that maybe in a university environment because, uh, like you said, the openness of it, you know, right. willingness to kind of work with what you have. You know, bringing in students to, to help do right. things. Right, and you also have. Students coming in, students going out. Going students out. coming in, students going out. Absolutely. So you have a lot of a lot more people coming in and out, and it, you know that also increases how much exposure you have. So and then, and you also have these students who don't care about their passwords or their accounts. <laughs> yeah, you know all that as well. So anyway, 
I guess we'll wrap yeah, it up. Wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Mike Hill. I'm Preston Wiley. Uh, Keith Watson will be out next week as well, probably. Um, so, uh, so I don't know what we're going to talk about next week, but we'll figure it out. We'll find something. So, so thanks for watching. Uh, have a safe and secure day.